All right. Well, thanks for being with us today. And thank you for agreeing to do this. Of course, it's a pleasure. The, uh, in the preface to your Negri's latest book, Assembly, um, you start by posing the question, why have social movements been unable to create lasting social change? And so that, in fact, protest is not enough. The goal, of course, is social transformation. Can you talk about why you decided to write this book? What was the impetus for this? Well, in some ways, the impetus was uh, enthusiasm around the whole cycle of struggles in 2011. Enthusiasm about them and then recognition of their incompleteness. You know, in some ways, so what I mean by that is uh, 2010, 2011, so that the so-called Arab Spring, thinking particularly of Tunisia and Egypt, um, but then by spring of that year in Spain, a whole series of movements, sometimes going under the name the Indignados or the 15th of M, that's the way the Spaniards would refer to it. Also in Greece, a, a lot of things happening before Occupy starts in the U.S. in September. And all of them had similar practices, you know, encampments or occupations, often of central squares in, in, in cities. And they were super inspiring, all demanding democracy in new ways, um, all kinds of creative things going on in them. But, you know, an occupation outside is not going to last forever. Um, you know, you're not going to sleep outside all winter. Um, <laughs> it wasn't imagined that that form, you know, was going to uh, be permanent. Um, but, you know, I think this, it, it's not so much that, that Tony and I were... And we certainly weren't disappointed in the movement. Certainly, it's definitely not that. But we definitely did register that, you know, many of the activists involved in the movements were asking these questions. Like, how could something so inspiring, demanding something that so many people want, how could it not uh, affect lasting change? And, and in fact, what would you have to do different um, for that to come about? That's what, you know, we thought was... It was our kind of interpretation of what activists in these various, you know, different national locations, very different kind of movements, what they were all asking. So that's why we, I mean, that's, you said, what, what was the inspiration for it? It's sort of, that's what we perceived as a, um, I don't know if the most urgent question, that's always hard to say, but the unurgent question about, um, about the status and the form of, of social movements today. And as a response to the to the supposed sort of, as people would say, failures of those movements, though I think we could probably word that differently, but some have equated those failures to a lack of leadership. And so this is a central part also of the first section of your book, which is this idea around leadership, this idea of also sort of going back, that there's a lot of people on the left who are saying, yeah, these, le these movements are great, but they're lacking these leaders. And you address that directly. That, that right. in fact, there's sort of two leadership functions, that there's the decision-making and also the assembly, but that this does not require centralized rule, but that some situations might dictate centralized decision-making, but always that these decisions would be subordinate to the multitude, to the movements. Right, right. But even before getting there, and like that's that seems really important, you know, to me what you're just saying. But even before getting there, I mean, I think it's useful to recognize that, you know, it's not just in the last decade, the last several decades, you know, at least since the 60s or 70s, um, social movements throughout the world have criticized undemocratic structures within the movements themselves. Um, you know, so in the name of democracy, they've they've um, criticized the centralized authority, you know, within the movement, whether it's a, like a leadership council or a charismatic leader, uh, all, most often men, et cetera. And the, the, this demand for democracy in the movement, you know, so that there if we I guess we should recognize that the way we've arrived at these so-called leaderless movements 
which I'm sure you and I are going to have to look at that term a little more closely in a minute. But we, it, the, we've arrived at them for very good reasons. You know, so that the critique of leadership is um, a longstanding and um, I would say correct one, you know, a critique of leadership, like I say, in the name of democracy. So like, first of all, we need to recognize when we got there. The other thing, uh, when one looks at it with that historical perspective is, um, you know, even if you did think, even if one did think that some movement with a centralized leadership, I don't know, a traditional party structure, some charismatic leader, et cetera, even if one did think that was better, it's useless to demand that today because that the movements themselves have created a kind of, um, you know, I think of it almost like an, uh, immunological system. Like whenever some form of leadership arrives, they have antibodies that immediately attack it. It's just, it's part of the nature of the movements today. Um, and I think they're right for thinking that, but, um, but I think uh, what I'm part of partly pointing out is that's what, if you want to, if we want to think about the way movements are, are going to function today, you have to start from that premise you know, the, of the demand for democracy within it. And then you have to think, you know, how can that be done in the way that will both be powerful enough to uh, challenge the ruling powers and coherent enough to be able to project a, an alternative society. Um, so those are, I mean, then that's, those are, those are, those are very large. Uh, those last two are very large questions, which require a lot of development, you know, both the theoretical kind of theoretical development you and I are, you know, engaging in now, but also the, and especially the kind of practical experimentation in movements themselves. Do you think we have to address the question of leadership before we, because in the preface, you also talk about how to take power, that the question isn't, are we going to take power, but how would we take power? What kind of power and who do we want to become in the process? Do you think that that goes before the question of leadership or are they sort of at the same time you would ask those questions or would one dictate the other? Yeah, but I guess, I guess they, they do seem like uh, the kind of questions that one would ask, um, that one would ask at the same time. I guess, uh, you know, one of the assumptions in that, in that, um, in that claim or question that you're referring to, you know, that Tony and I say it's not an issue of whether we should take power or not, but how we want to take power. I guess we're, we're, we're not of the opinion that, you know, all power is bad, power corrupts. I mean, I think we have to have a more differentiated understanding of the p potential forms of power and the kinds of power we can wield. And so that, you know, we don't want to, um, in any way reproduce the structures of oppression and domination that we're, that we're fighting against. You know, there, there I'm just saying like an obvious thing, but the, that people struggle with for a long time, but that's, that's, that's part of this question about, um, about the traditional and centralized forms of leadership, uh, and movements. Yeah. So I guess I, I maybe, maybe I'm just a round, roundabout way of coming back to, 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 to what you just asked, which is uh, you have to think about both at the same time. I mean, because if, um, if, if we are going to claim, you know, if we want to take power differently, you know, if we want to take power, so it's not just a change of personnel, you know, of us being in power rather than them, something like that, but actually transform the power itself, then we have to think about the, the structures of decision-making and the structures of, um, of discussion that, and the distribution of power within the movement themselves that, um, that would correspond to that. Yeah, so the two go together. Long way of saying, you know, you're totally right. The two go together. And, and, <laughs> and you, you know, thinking about the, the sort of roles of leadership. I mean, you correctly note in the book when people ask where have all the leaders gone? I mean, it seems very obvious to me that they've been jailed, tortured, or killed over the years. <laughs> I mean, that right. when you write that, it was like, yeah, I mean, people have asked this question to us all the time in movement organizing and just reminding them of what the state has done to leaders for the last 40 or 50 years or really forever. But I mean, this, and, and right. I also enjoy the fact that you mentioned that this is also part of the 
sort of counterinsurgency doctrine, something that, you know, Sergio and I are, are well aware of, but that this functions the same abroad. I know that you don't go into this in the in the book, but this is the same way that the U.S. empire sort of functions abroad as well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that the same, the same, same tactics used, um, whatever, about revolutionary uh, movements in Latin America are the same ones used against the Black Panthers in Oakland. Um, and, the, you know, to come back when you were saying it earlier about... Uh, Instead of saying that the movement, you know, you hesitated earlier, said, you know, obviously we don't think really that the movements failed, you know, thinking about 2011, but also the previous ones. It's much more useful to say that they were defeated. Um, they were defeated often militarily. And that's what, uh, and sometimes these, um, the ways, the disappearance of the leaders, you know, through assassination, through uh, counter-information tactics, through all kinds of um various devious um, counterinsurgency methods um, have led often in the past to the defeat of, uh, of these movements. You know, so one could argue, I, I don't think this is, this is not what Tony and I are most concerned on about with centralized leadership, but just with the point you were just raising there, one could argue against centralized leadership today for that practical reason that um, for decades, the uh, the ruling classes have functioned by um, the notion that if you cut off the head, the body will die. Like so, identify the leaders, um, kill or imprison, or somehow discredit those leaders, and that will that will depotentialize the movement. Um, and so, one could argue that you know having a more distributed structure would be a kind of inoculation against that kind of kind of power strategies. I think that's a valid argument. Like I say, it's, it concerns me least less than what should I call it? The internal argument within movements that is more focused on uh, democratic decision-making and um, participation. And yeah, and uh, that's, that's what seems to me more pressing. And you know what I, more, Oh, okay, go ahead. I was going to say, what I find interesting is that in our experience, it's not just that self-identified leftists or people in the movement are asking that question, but that when you bring so-called ordinary people into the mix, that they too yeah. have like an automatic response to this sort of charismatic person up front, you know, speaking the good word and, you know, giving everyone the, the you know, lowdown on like what they're going to do or, you know, this this is the plan, follow us. Like there's there's a, an immediate negative response just on behalf of people that we bring in who are just getting involved with the movements. I'm not talking about here like lifelong leftists or activists. I'm talking like people right. who are coming in for the first time. I think that's, that's totally right. I mean, another place one sees it is, is you know, journalists who can't, who can't manage to understand how movements can function without leaders. They always talk about, oh, I don't know, weak leadership structures or you know, it, it makes no sense to them or something like that. And what they don't recognize are the forms of organization that, um, that go on in, uncent you know, in, 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 in less centralized ways or, or through, you know, various other structures. Um, that's, yeah, that's also, I mean, I think you're right that people who don't have experience in the movements and, and maybe we should just put journalists in that same in that same bunch. Um, well, and they're having they a rough time. Understand how, and you know, that brings up another point that seems really important to go into, or at least, I mean, to pose it's, 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 uh, I'm certainly not in a position really to answer it at all, but when we say, and I think this is true of the movements, you know, over the last several decades, when one says that, um, that there's a critique of leadership and a demand for democracy in the movements and collective decision making. That's not a criticism of organization. On the contrary, that requires more organization, you know, more attention to organization. And so the, you know, the challenges that movements have faced over the last day, I mean, in some ways it's uh, easier, more straightforward. And I think that's what the, uh, you know, when you're referring to the, um, to the people who are new to the activism who assume that there has to be um, a leadership structure in place in order to function. Um, they don't realize that there's 
actually more organizational work that has to happen in order to make a movement function democratically. Um, sometimes from the outside, people assume that the critique of centralization or critique of centralized leadership means a critique of organization. And that's, I think that's exactly the opposite of what the way it is and the way it has to be. Our local organizing body has gotten shit for this for the last three years since we started it. And that is people from the city, not maybe, you know, just regular folks, but people in power and particularly people in other political organizations constantly come to us and they're like, who the hell is in charge? And we're like, we're like, well, there's no one necessarily in charge. Um, there is no spokesperson. There is, and, and by doing that for the last three years, we've found ourselves in a position where sometimes we're not able to take action in the same way that other groups are, but that mm -hmm. also it's been difficult to try and find how we can relate to those groups if those groups also function very differently. So if people, a lot of groups are used to like, hey, bring your executive director to the other executive director's office or whoever your union president is, bring him into the meeting. Um, they, they don't quite understand. I, and to be quite honest with you, I, one of the things I like about the book is that you're talking about this as like an experimental thing, which is the way that yeah. we see both the community organization that we're a part of, but then also the community space that we run. I mean, we've long saw this as like, we're experimenting. We're going to continue to experiment. We haven't found any specific model that there's in different contexts, different methods that work better than others, different structures that work better than others, but that there isn't a set sort of model that we're working off of. And that's been difficult for some of our, you know, other comrades and, and so forth to kind of, I think, deal with. Right. If that makes well, sense. That, I mean, it also, it is difficult. I mean, one should, we should admit that it's not, um, you know, having no recipe or handbook or model to follow does mean that things, you know, are difficult and things get fucked up sometimes. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's not always, um, it's not always clear. I mean, it's obviously, maybe I'm saying the obvious here, it's not always the most efficient you know, it, it, it having I I I'm not I'm not sure if I'm completely wrong. And maybe it's just in this curtain, you know, in the context we live in, it would probably be more efficient to have you know some central some one person who made all the decisions or something like that. Luckily, in politics, efficiency is not the only criterion. Um, and so if we if we have to do something that takes longer, you know that um, that so be it, you know, and there's more, it, it requires more work, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, go this, this is, um, you know, might not be, I, I, I don't know. I'm curious if it works this way with your collective, but you know, a lot of the, a lot of the general assemblies that, you know, each of one of the things that was common with each of these occupations in 2011 was some, some, and, and since then too, was some form of a general assembly, you know, some form of, uh, decision-making structure. And any, you know, I, I thought they were quite a beautiful thing, but anyone who's participated in it knows is how frustrating sometimes <laughs> it can be, you know, how long things can take and how things get confused. And, um, you know, so it's not a kind of immediately whatever I was going to say utopian, but, you know, just easy and, and, and an efficient process. It, it requires a lot of time and a lot of work and, and sometimes doesn't work very well. But like you're saying, it is a constant political experiment. Um, that's, I was going to say, that's the phase we're in. I wonder if we're always in that phase, but anyway, it, we're, we're certainly in that phase now of experimenting with political forms that match our aspirations, you know, because it, it seems quite clear to me. And I think this is a relatively generalized feeling. It's the ones, you know, the political forms we have to work with are not ones we want. Right. And we don't just want to replicate, you know, the, what, um, you know, the existing ones out there. So, yeah, so that's, um, and it's harder that way. It, it is definitely harder. The thing I'll note though, is that I think sometimes what we sacrifice for efficiency in political movements, we, 
we sort of gain in not only participation, but that going through those difficult assembly processes, going through the consensus, having those difficult conversations, it actually allows a space for people to grow. That in fact, in this culture, it seems today, and maybe even in left culture, just generally, I'm generally speaking here about the left in the U.S., that there's sort of this aversion to conflict and an aversion to going through difficult processes that like people are already leaving a difficult world. They're leaving a shitty job and then they're, you know, then they're coming into this political space and they're like, Jesus Christ, like, do I also have to go through all of this shit? But if you do it, I think in a decent way that respects everyone, what I've found is that people grow so much through those processes as opposed to simply having a leader, a set structure, the decisions are made and now you follow them like a soldier would in an army or something. Right. Which, which of course is the old language, you know, of cadre and, you know, you know, the, the hierarchy of a certain centralized political structure did have the, all that military terminology, but, you know, another way of saying what you were just saying, which, which seems to me exactly right, which, you know, even whatever anecdotally my own, you know, uh, pathetic political biography, whatever, you know, at a certain point I realized that, um, Politic, doing politics was itself a joyful life experience. And so it wasn't so much that I, you know, was started, you know, was viewing doing politics. I mean, of course, there are, you know, goals and, and we want to achieve something and we want things to be lasting, etc. But when I started realizing that participation in the political process, you know, being part of a movement was itself joyful that then, you know, shifted the way of thinking about it. So the kind of growing that you were talking about, you know, like that we together learn or, or become different or maybe even become better. Um, I guess that's what I was identifying with the concept of joy. You know, is this, I, I, I'm, I, I have a weakness of always thinking in certain kind of philosophical terms, but Spinoza, a 17th century Dutch philosopher, favorite of mine, he defines joy as the increase of our power to think and act. And so in some ways doing politics together is joyful in that it, just like you were saying it, it increases our power to think and act. And anyway, it's a nice way of, it's a way of, it, it has been for me a nice way of thinking, um, but, uh, not, not just a nice way of thinking about it, an accurate way of thinking about it. That's what it means. <laughs> the right way of thinking about it for me, at least. And it is a joyous endeavor. I mean, I people have asked me over the years that people in my family, friends, social network who aren't as involved or haven't been involved with these movements, you know, they always ask like, gosh, you look frustrated sometimes or man, it looks like you guys are constantly getting your teeth kicked in and it must be really rough. And I think anyone who's seriously engaged in these movements understands the toll that it takes on you physically, spiritually, mentally, the whole thing. But that it's also that I wouldn't give up the last 15 years of my life for anything that the experiences, right. the people that I've met, the places I've been able to go, the collective experiences that I've had with people all over the world. Uh, I, I can't, I couldn't name something that w that could compare to those experiences. Um, and maybe that's an overstatement, right. but that is, that's how I feel at least in the social realm of doing this, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I was going to ask you about unofficial leadership, because one of the things that we, I think, have a difficulty with, something that we've tried to work out is that, okay, so we don't want to have this centralized hierarchical leadership structure for determining strategy, or even maybe even for determining, say, how the organization should function or the, so not outwardly, but even inwardly, but that one of the things we always keep our eye on, you didn't mention this in the book, but it's just something that I'd like to note. As an, as an aside, and that is that sometimes I think what we also have to keep an eye out for is sort of unofficial leadership bodies um, that can sort of arise within organizing contexts. And sometimes I would argue that this is actually worse than having like an actual centralized command that like, yeah, that if you allow these sort of internal clicks to form and that even though those decisions aren't officially being made by say those four or five people in the group, but it is in fact those four or five people who are making decisions that this creates a lot of troubling internal group dynamics. 
Absolutely. Yeah, you're totally right. You remind me of a, of an essay from uh, from the 1970s by Joe Freeman, you know, within the feminist movement that, that I think circulated in 2011 a certain amount called the tyranny of structurelessness. And part of her argument was that these cliques formed, you know, sometimes by friendship groups, sometimes by people who had more education and therefore could speak better, yep. sometimes other things, and that, um, and that these kind of unstated uh, leadership that is, is, is super detrimental to a movement. So the kind of, um, yeah, she was arguing like you are for a kind of transparency about these things um, and have it, you know, at least out in the open and then, and then try to figure ways that we can, um, you know, I, I think it's true that we can't always assume that everyone is immediately always equal in their participation. You know, right. that's, there, there's a, there's a, a detriment to that too. I mean, <clears throat> And I've admired that a lot of um, movements, you know, like going back to the various general assemblies, I've admired that a lot of them have tried to tackle this by um, ordering the stack, you know, ordering who gets to speak next by people who have, you know, traditionally not had the power to speak um, or who might, you know, have more difficulty speaking, you know, so to try to counteract the tendency towards these unstated um, structures of leadership that you're pointing to. But it's, it's, um, it's part of the, it's part of the struggle to figure out how to construct democratic decision-making. I mean, I think this is, this is again, this is still part of that same requirement of experimentation. And you, the only thing I would add is that beyond even sort of, say, mechanisms within organizing uh, meetings or within uh, assemblies, that we've found that also social activities help outside of the political realm, outside of work and outside of people's day-to-day -day lives. Like, people within the assembly, within the collective, within the group that you're working with, intentionally finding ways to connect with people in the group who they don't otherwise identify with. So making sure that you have, if you start to see some of those clicks form, what I've found, and this might be helpful for people listening, is to sort of directly confront that the clicks are forming and then make sure that the people inside of those clicks actually start to broaden, that those five people aren't the ones having dinner and drinking wine every Friday night, that they should be going to other people in the group and expanding those, so, those social networks to help build the, bond, the bonds and trust not only necessary to get maximum participation for people who otherwise wouldn't participate, but to sort of break up that, that click that could be forming. I, you don't necessarily have to respond to that, but that's something that we found that is useful. No, it sounds, that sounds exactly right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, I'm not qualified to know this or not, and I don't know if it, this is even a proper question, but the, I wanted to know if this urge for centralized control that it seems to me sort of runs counter to the sort of philosophical roots of left politics. So this idea that like human beings, like I hear this from people on the left and it really drives me nuts where they're like, oh, people are just fucking stupid and Americans are this or that. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like I thought being on the left was at least part of it to me is that the, the idea is that human beings are inherently creative beings who seek freedom from authority, that this is sort of how we view uh, human beings that part of that centralized control is like, it almost reminds me of like conservative philosophy. That's like, we have to kind of control this rabble, but in a different way. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. It's, um, that's hard. It's a hard problem to address right then. I mean, I, or, or rather, I mean, you're totally right in the sense that, you know, the tradition of thought of liberation and equality runs counter to that kind of assumption, you know, the kind of assumption that um, some people have to be in control and the others have to follow, something like that. But, but we have a very long tradition within liberation politics of these uh, centralized structures. So, so we also have that to contend with, you know, they, um, 
And, you know, not, and I, and I don't mean to, in fact, I certainly don't myself want to disown all of the, um, those past movements, the legacies that, um, you know, I think they should be often whatever criticized or analyzed or something like that. But, um, you know, the communist traditions that had vanguard movements, the, um, the anti-racist movements that had charismatic male leaders, the uh, colonial, anti-colonial liberation struggles that had, uh, you know, similar sorts of uh, both military and centralized structures. I, I consider them, you know, legacies that I want to be a part of, but, um, but we don't have to be that way. I mean, that's what, so anyway, I, I guess I was just, just wanted to say that even, even though, like you're saying, you know, the, the, the philosophical assumptions that we make, you know, that we have and that we're, you know, should be, you know, that all are created equal, that we can all do. We, we still have a large tradition to struggle with that, um, that, but that's an important part of the struggle. I mean, that's an important, that's nothing new, I guess, too. That's the other thing. Um, we have to struggle with those traditions um, that are, that are, I was going to say that are our own, but that like that we want to, that we still want to feel part of. I think that's been, this is going a little off track from what I have for my notes and what's in the book, but I, it's one of the things too, that we've noticed from, uh, we, we just call them ordinary folks. I mean, we, this is, we, we're using terminology from, uh, Francis Fox Piven and a, a union organizer by the name of Jane McAlevey. Um, mm-hmm. We've also noticed that that's the case, that ordinary people actually, that people aren't involved in the movements actually understand a lot of this as well, that they, so they'll hear us speak about, say, human beings in one way on the left, but then they look at some of the history and they say, man, that's not quite how it's, it's unfolded. So when you say, and I agree, and we're going to get to this, this concept or this idea that you and, and Tony are doing with uh, sort of reappropriating language and fighting over some of these definitions, which I think is really worthwhile, um, especially concepts like democracy and freedom. Um, but that people actually get this, that, that people see this and they go, Hey, I don't know if I want to be a part of this. And then it's, it poses a difficult question for those of us who are involved because a lot of people who are involved with these, you know, different movements, they might not be as well versed. They might not understand the whole history of, of uh, you know, socialist, communist revolutions, liberation movements. So they feel very intimidated by this because they might run into somebody who starts dropping all this information, whether factually correct or not, about Stalinism or about this or the other thing. And, and it, it, it really intimidates people, which is why we, I think, in some ways have tried to go back to those philosophical roots as opposed to sort of rehash as much as we too also identify and I think defend a lot of the previous political projects that the left has been involved with, we don't necessarily want to be directly associated with all of them because they bring up such sort of horrific imaginations for people who are just getting involved with the movement. Right. No, that's totally, that's totally right. One has to choose when um, and how, I mean, some ways choosing, those historical legacies is a bit like choosing which concepts to struggle over, you know, which you were referring to a minute ago, you know, so sometimes, you know, um, yeah, I think it's sort of the same one has to, one has to evaluate what you, what you gain and what you, what you lose. Um, for instance, Tony and I, like you said, have been, very um, energetic or spend a lot of energy trying to rethink the concept of democracy. Um, and a lot of, you know, theorists or, you know, left theorists that we're friends with and stuff that really feel like that's, you know, that the concept of democracy has been so degraded um, and so thoroughly defined by a certain, um, you know, standard usage of it that we really can't, you know, that they have to not use it anymore. Um, so it's a kind of judgment whether one, you know, whether we think that it's important enough to, um, yeah, take the risk of being associated with 
all of those meanings and struggle over them or not. So in the similar way that, um, you know, I don't usually, um, you know, I, I don't usually find it useful in, 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 in discussions with people I don't know, especially to say, you know, well, I'm a communist and, you know, I feel part of the communist tradition. It, like, cause, because like you say that in the US especially you know that that just gets um that just clouds the whole conversation and they can't understand what I'm talking about. Yep. Um yep. So you have to choose which ones uh you know almost whatever tactically figure out which what what makes um what makes sense and is most useful. Yeah, you know, both the concepts and the traditions. I guess they they seem kind of linked to me. That makes a lot of sense to me. The Let's. I want to bring to bring us up to this problem of representative democracy. Now, this is something also that we've noticed both within the movement, but then also with the ordinary folks in our city, town, region, state, even throughout the country. That this, you know, you argue that this sort of paradigm of representation is ending, but that there's no new form that's really taken shape yet, and that we're sort of in this, we're living through this transition process. I think ordinary people get this on a deep level, and in fact. This was our experience with the Bernie campaign. So even if we look at, we were organizing pretty heavy for the Bernie campaign for probably two reasons. One is an obvious reason that we thought it was probably by far the best option we would have to defeating Trump and the right, though that could be debated as well. But we would contend that that was the case. But then also that it allowed us an opportunity to reach out to people who otherwise wouldn't be involved with the political process. So I have a lot of friends on the left who are like, Oh, but, you know, I mean, really some valid critiques of Bernie. Uh, there's many to make um, and the campaign. But we would always ask them, like, well, what should we be doing right now? Like if you in other words, if you're going to have millions of people get involved with the political process for the first time, it doesn't mean that we don't we're not critical of the campaign. It doesn't mean we're not critical of the process but that we should at least engage in it to hopefully meet people where they're at, but not leave them there and then bring them into movement politics. Um, but that we saw that people were actually more sophisticated than a lot of left and progressive thinkers and writers were, where we would talk with people on the street or go knock on doors and people would say, why the hell would I get involved with this campaign? They fucked them in 2016. They're going to do it again. I'm like, what are you people crazy? <laughs> and, and here are all these like seasoned activists like myself and others who are like, trying to find ways to like, well, no, but maybe if there's more, but they kind of knew on a deep level. And that's why I think you saw less participation on behalf of young people in 2020 than you did in 2016. For, for instance, in 2016, in LaPorte County, where we live in, Mich in uh, Indiana, we were going to house parties with like 50, 80, 100 people at, this, at these house parties for Bernie Sanders. In 2020, we were lucky if we could get 10 people to show up to a, a phone banking event. And it was all due to the fact that most people saw that like they just don't buy into it. I would argue, I don't know if there's any evidence for this, but I would argue this has really been the case since 2008. That in 2008, when Obama got elected, it was the first time that Indiana went blue in 44 years since LBJ. It was also probably the last time Indiana will go blue. Um, <laughs> And, and I think you, this kind of, I don't know if this gets to what you guys, I mean, I know that what you're saying is much deeper, but this is how we're experiencing it, at least on the ground. Yeah. You know, it's complicated. So, I mean, the, 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 I guess, philosophical point that we're making, which I think is, you know, which you, and then the people that you, you know, were recounting, talking to take for granted, I guess, is this. Uh, recognition that um, is that the way we're sold representation really doesn't like we know that that's not true like we know that they don't represent us um, that's that's pretty clear like uh, so um, and that I mean in some ways uh, Tony and I are sort of trying to work through that um, that recognition you know and I don't know it seems important partly to me because there is such a tradition of that, you know, like, I don't know, Madison in the Federalist Papers says, you know, that that's what the U.S., you know, he says Republicanism, but you know what we would later say is U.S. democracy is based on the notion of representation. That's the key idea. And it's just, um, 
you know, I think that whatever its truth was in in in, in the 18th, late eighteenth century, it's it's just clear that it's not now. But then, but then the question is, and this is where you're going with this. Well, what should you do next? You know, like if, um, and I, at least I would say, like you are, that we can't at the moment. You know, we're in a phase where um, we can't either. Uh, put our faith in representatives that they, you know, if we pick the right one, that, you know, politician will save us. But we also can't, or at least seems to me imprudent to completely ignore the, um, the representative system. You know, there are a number of examples of, of, uh, how should I put it? You know, of representative experiments that foster rather than close off the movements and social participation. You know, the, an obvious one, but it's outside the U.S., is thinking about these municipal experiments in Spain, particularly like Barcelona. You know, so the, the government of Ada Calau is the name of the mayor, who's elected, and she, in some ways, it, it has been trying to uh, orchestrate a kind of um, political structure on the city level that allows for the participation of movements, you know, something, something halfway between. Right. And I think that, that there are a number of the most um, exciting political projects, you know, re- electoral projects in, in recent years have been ones that allow for um, the movements to, you know, run things or participate. And so, you know, my, my hope at different points for the Bernie campaign is that it maybe it could have done something like that, uh, at least in certain limited ways. Um, so I too, like you, you know, felt like that within, and I do think it's important, you know, in the, in, in our current U S situation that, um, you know, that we have, better rather than worse of these uh, politicians in um, in place. You know, in certain cities in the U.S. too, city council, there are a number of city councils where where there are similarly, you know, elected representatives who open up to the movements in that way. Yeah. Carlos um, Rosa and uh, Carlos Rosa and Byron Sigcho Lopez in uh, Chicago. I just want to throw that out there for people who might be listening. That's great. Yeah. Those are Great. two two examples. Here's the here's um, yeah. Pardon me, or I hope the listeners pardon me even more if I keep going back to philosophical examples. But I was inspired by, uh, you know, so Gilles Deleuze, a French philosopher, you know, died a few decades ago. So rel- relatively contemporary. Great um, love of mine, and so he in an interview. Uh, he, he did one of these interviews, like a super clever interview where for each letter of the alphabet, the interviewer would like propose a concept and he would have to say something about it. So when they got to uh, the letter G, she proposed a uh, gauche left, you know, what is the left? And so he responded by saying, there is no such thing as the left. There is only something that can, you know, there there is only something that politicians that could give space to the left. You know, like, so he's sort of recognizing in a kind of similar way, we're talking about these, I don't know, city council people or, or these municipal structures where um, it's not like we should say it's a left government. We should say it's a government that gives space to the left. I, I don't know. I love the distinction between um, assuming that the, the representatives in power can embody the left but right. or but instead to think of them as those who could facilitate rather than the usual ones that block uh, what is really the left, you know, which is embodied, I think, in uh, mass movements. Anyway, all that's coming back to the question about representation. And um, I mean, the, the philosophical question of representation, you know, like you started that way, which quickly merges with the practical questions of what we're going to do about electoral politics. Right. Um, and, and it's never, it's, uh, it's always complicated and there's never just, uh, some sort of definitive answer. 
um, I mean, what I guess what we could we could pose the two the two boundaries, you know, which it sounds like neither you nor I would be comfortable with. The one would be um, just say that's all corrupt. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna vote. I'm not gonna think about it, etc. The other one, and 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 have be pure in a sense by being you know separated from all of that um, disgusting falsifications that happens in the electoral scene or the other boundary, which is to believe that if we were to elect the right person, then finally we would have someone who would represent us and we could essentially go home and relax because they'll be doing the work for us. No. Um, I think neither one is right. I mean, maybe I'm saying, I, I, I don't even have to say, I think, you know, obviously neither one is right. It seems obvious to me, um, but we have to negotiate somewhere between them um, and find even principles for doing that negotiation. No, and that's something that what you and I have been saying in the last 10 minutes, it seems to me, is figuring out principles and, and models for doing that negotiation. And beyond even the individuals elected hoping that they will make better decisions, even now, so now we have this debate on the left in the U.S. that's like, how much, so the DSA Jacobin sort of approach to this has been, and I think it's probably, if indeed the your goal is to really play in that electoral field as it stands, it seemed to make sense to me with the electoral structures that we have in the United States, that sort of taking over in whatever way that is even possible, the Democratic Party, or using it, how do I say this a different way, using it as a vessel for sort of left politics seems to me to make more sense than going with the Green Party, or now I think in the in the absence of Bernie Sanders' campaign, you know, or in the absence of him being the nominee for the Democratic Party, that there's now a new debate that's sort of an old debate about should we have a socialist party? But it seems to me that that goes beyond just electing individuals, but that there's this hope that if we had a real workers' party or whatever you want to call it, that even if you had a party apparatus that wasn't relying on individuals per se, but say a whole network of people that even that in and of itself is probably insufficient, particularly within the electoral parameters that we have in the U S system. It, 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 is that how you're seeing this as well? Or what, what would your thoughts be? I would definitely, it, it definitely seems, uh, but, but it's still in that double mode, the way we've been talking this whole time here, which is that on the one hand, it seems to be yes, insufficient, um, it would be part of that structure. On the other hand, I'd vote for it. You know, like I think uh, I would, you know, I would, I would support it. It would be a kind of, I think one has to have a kind of, um, I wouldn't even call it cynical, but, but uh, being able to act without believing that it will solve our problems. Um, and so, but which, which also means that we can't, I mean, at least in my view, that we can't, um, stop doing other work because right. uh, we assume that that would be the um, the end of all of all our troubles. I don't know if that's the right way of saying it, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah, and I think the difficulty with stopping doing other work, as far as I can tell, is that one of the calculations we always have to make is capacity. So it's like we have limited time, limited resources, limited capacity. What are the kinds yeah. of political projects that allow us to br to expand our capacity? Um, and if, in mm -hmm. fact, it looks like engaging an electoral campaign will do that, then I think if that makes sense to do, then to do it. I mean, I don't think we should be dogmatic about it. I think the right. difficulty we find is that, yeah, we're trying to balance, okay, so with the Bernie campaign, it, it was true that other things kind of went to the wayside and we kind of had to reevaluate how much time are we spending on this campaign? What are we getting out of this campaign in terms of building the movement, bringing new people in? And what are other things that can bring people in? We've had more people interested in what we're doing over the last three weeks than we've had over the last three years. So, <laughs> and much of that yeah. is, is outside of our control, which is even more frustrating, um, but sort of gets to, well, you know, points that people like Francis Fox Piven have made others. Um, but yeah. Well, I was just thinking that, you know, it, uh, periodically in these kind of discussions, it, it's helpful to go back to recognize that, um, how should I put it? You know, like when, uh, often when I find myself having a discussion, like what is to be done, usually the, first 
thing one should think about is what are people already doing because it it it, it probably is already better. So I was thinking how, um, you know, in the various demonstrations I've been to in the last few weeks, um, there's always been um, a voter drive that's associated with it. You know, so that's part of. Um, so it, I wouldn't say it's not that the various you know things going under the umbrella of Black Lives Matter now is really just a. Uh, voter registration drive, you know, obviously not, but there's, there's no, I think that the activists involved and the people organizing these movements see no contradiction between registering people to vote and, you know, participating with, 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 you know, a set of politicians that, that I, I would say most everybody doesn't feel satisfied with and also continuing the struggle and the protest against the system, you know, so I, I, I yep. think that uh, it's useful to recognize how, what should I say, maybe a generation of activists, you know, because I, and also the demonstrations I've been to in the last few weeks, predominantly people between 20 and 35, you know, so this generation of activists, I think, doesn't feel the kind of, the need to make that decision, say, oh, either you're going to go into you know, doing electoral politics, or you're going to you're going to go into a contestational struggle. You know, uh, the, the, no, you do both. Yeah. You know, and they they feel it seems to me they feel quite comfortable with both and don't seem to see any uh, contradiction between them. Yeah. Anyway, that's I think it's 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 is echoing what you were what you were just saying. It's just um, and and I'm I'm glad that people are already working through that and a lot more sophisticated what also blows my mind is this level of sophistication has grown since you know you date 2011 um i got involved in 2006 when i came back from iraq and i it's been amazing to me with the lack of steady organizations but the explosion of movements that there's been a gain in sophistication even without the official organizational mechanisms so that a lot of the people today who are getting involved sort of automatically go into these uprisings, movement moments with far more sophistication than we had eight, nine, even five years ago. I find that amazing because my experiences have, yeah. have been similar to yours. Um, so even in the absence of that organization, the level of sophistication has grown tremendously. That's totally, yes. That's definitely been my experience too. It's one of those things that I'm really been amazed and and thrilled by in the last few weeks is um the and i think something that's really radically different from 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 the post ferguson baltimore moments which is that the sophistication of the understanding about racism among among young white people is so much more developed you know that that one of the things one notices you know looking at the difference from you know four or five years ago um, of the Black Lives Matter protests is how many young white people are involved now and weren't involved then. And I think it's partly, it's not just a willingness, but it's um, an understanding of the nature of the racist structures in society. You know, like it's a, it's a develop, which, uh, you know, and I don't know where, I mean, it's probably coming from all things like, probably what people are learning in high school, what they learn in, in college, but also what they learn in movements. Like you're saying, um, there's been a real, um, there's been a real development that has allowed for, I think the, um, a, you know, a large proportion of white, um, participants in the movement. Um, Partly that all goes back to, you know, just to pose the generalized thing that you were getting to earlier, which is that, here, let me put it in the most abstract terms, but I think it's sort of what you were saying earlier, which is that there's, um, you know, there's, there's, there remains a incorrect assumption that, um, how should we say it, like intellectuals think and activists act, like that that's the division of labor. And it turns out, and now I'm just saying something anyone knows who's been involved in movements at all, is that there is an incredible amount of theoretical um, development and 
work done within movements. And so um, it's not just that, I don't know, that activists learn things by reading books or by talking to intellectuals or hearing from intellectuals is no. I mean, this is, you were talking about Frances Fox Piven before, this is definitely her type of argument. You know, that within movements themselves, they're a kind of um, education. Yeah, like, you know, it was one of those old things that Lenin used to, re- re- Lenin said that, you know, prison was really the university that he went to. Um, you know, because of the kind of study they did in prison. I, and I, one could just say a similar thing about movements. You know, movements are a kind of um, study space. You know, the way that people get um, a, a develop intellectually and, and create intellectual concepts that are, you know, and, and ideas that are, um, that are kind of in parallel to the kind of work, you know, intellectual work that gets done in, whatever, wherever I do intellectual work in libraries, you know, (laughs) something like that. And I would also add, I know it's probably unpopular to say, because I understand the destructive nature of social media as well, but I, and I think it's just easier to say that, but I also think that social media has played, the access to social media and things like YouTube has played such a huge role in so now I'm talking not so much about the people who might develop that knowledge or through the experience of uh, the experiences of interacting with a movement, but the people who are just coming into movement spaces for the first time, who come into the spaces with a much more sophisticated understanding of systemic racism and how it's connected to other forms of oppression than I had as someone in the movement 10 years ago. And, the yeah. old, you know, talking with them, it's like, well, where are you getting this from? And it's like, oh, my friend, I follow my one friend on Twitter or social media or Facebook, or I follow this YouTube page and they do like 20 minute uh, sessions about, you know, this or that or the other thing. And now it might not be as deep as say someone who went to university or someone who's like fully immersed in a movement, but it... No, I I don't even think that's right. I mean, I think I'm totally on board with what you're saying and I don't, Maybe the depth, I, I know what you mean, but I, I kind of think we have to view these different knowledges as, you know, kind of, um, you know, standing on equal footing. But, you know, what's something so su- super interesting about the way you're saying it is, you know, when the, the people who study social movements often talk about, or even the, you know, journalistic view about social movements talk about how social media functions. And it's usually what they're referring to is, you know, like the George Floyd video or the, you know, something that will create outright rage or something like that. But what they're not talking about is what you're pointing towards, which is the incredible educational um, depth that is going on. You know, the series of webinars and, and just continual explanation and, 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 and discussion, you know, that's, you know, that goes on. So it's not just a, it's not just, you know, like, watching a video of some horrible act because that's i think what usually gets picked up you know as the the way that social media functions it it's in fact a kind of educational platform i I like that's that seems i I wouldn't that seems really right to me and i i wouldn't have thought of it that way but i i I see exactly what you mean over the last three weeks michael it's it struck me that So I've had friends on the left over the last three weeks say, I can't believe that to a point you brought up that this many young white people are down with this movement and understand systemic racism in the way that they do. Number two, they've said, I can't believe people are this angry and that they're willing to do these kinds of like, you know, actions like burning down a police station, occupying government buildings. I have sort of two responses to that. One is you need to get in the fucking streets a little more often and talk to actual people, (laughs) like go talk to people in a goddamn bar or or wherever you are, like go see, you know, where they're coming from. Um, But that also, you know, you have a lot of people who are picking this up through these mediums. And then now it's like, they're looking for an outlet to actually you know, where can they project this in a way that's not just isolated at home? In other words, it's forced me to reevaluate the role of social media. And I do use it, though I've been pretty critical of it in the past. But this also reminds me of sort of this misreading of 2015, 2016, where a lot of people on the left were like, 
I, nobody likes Donald Trump. And now from my personal experience of living in a Rust Belt town in Indiana, I knew that wasn't the case. And that's anecdotal. But what's not anecdotal is that Joe Rogan's podcast and Alex Jones's podcasts are two of the most listened to podcasts in the United States, that they have tens of millions of people who download their programs. And I don't mean to necessarily put those two people in the same category, though I think they are in the same realm. Um, and the left just seemed totally ignorant of that. Like a lot of the establishment left, a lot of the professors, writers, journalists, whoever else, you know, active people who are, you know, people I really respect, they weren't like aware that that world even existed. So when they were asking like, well, who are all these people who like Donald Trump? I was like, you need to go listen to the Joe Rogan podcast. And they were like, well, who the fuck is Joe Rogan? And I was like, well, he hosts the number one listen to radio program in the country. <laughs> people are like, oh, really? I was like, well, yeah, like, I, I kind of see the same thing happening this time around where there's a lot of people on the left, but from a different angle, sort of asking, my God, like, where are all these angry people coming from? Or I can't believe that there's this many people down with this. And I was like, well, that's because you're not engaged in the sort of mediums that a lot of the younger people, 18 to 35, are engaged with, that you're still watching MSNBC and reading the New York Times. And there are useful things to get out of that, I guess, as well. Um, but that that's not where you know, 15 year olds to 35 year olds are getting their information. That's not where they're interacting. That's not where they're getting their politics from. Right. Right. Um, anyway, I, yeah. I, I must admit this is like, uh, this shifts a little bit, but it's something that I've felt, um, whatever, a certain kind of, you know, something Tony and I weren't, weren't capable of in this book. Like one of the things, when we started writing about leadership and about social movements, like we recognize, you know, not all social movements are are progressive or liberation movements. You know, there are, there are plenty of right wing, reactionary, horrible social movements. But I must admit that I and this is a completely uninteresting thing to say, I suppose. But I I can't manage to study them. Um, like you were saying before, that one should, uh, you know, one has to listen to these podcasts, and I think you're right. I realize when I study, you know, reactionaries, it makes me sad. You know, it's just, <laughs> no, it just sounds like a stupid thing to say. You know, so and I totally admire people like a friend of mine, Corey Robin. He's great at studying, you know, in a in a both intellectual and journalistic way, studying reactionary thought. You know, reactionary thought of all kinds and and the contemporary stuff. I kind of find that it's not something. I can do. So Tony and I tried in one chapter in this book, you know, a section, not a chapter, really. I don't know. It's sort of yeah. to, 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 to at least try to recognize how right wing movements are really largely derivative of the accomplishments of left wing movements. You know, they kind of, uh, they don't really invent anything. They just sort of recycle and from the opposite side, things that the left has done. Um, like, for instance, I mean, here's a super simple example from the 1980s was this thing called Operation Rescue, which was an anti-abortion thing. And, <clears throat> you know, super right wing movement and horrible. And what they would do is their tactic was uh, they would do sit ins in front of um, abortion clinics. And so it was it looked just like, you know, students or civil rights sit-ins from, you know, a decade previously. Um, they just sort of, and, and I think this is, this is, this is true about right-wing movements continually, is a, is a kind of recycling of the left. But all that to say, that was the only, I don't know, we didn't have much, is, is that I, I, I recognize a failing in myself, which you were pointing to 10 minutes ago or five minutes ago, which was that... Um, I should be able to study the right wing more, but like I say, it's just, I, I realize it's, um, it's something I was going to say that I'm not good at. It's, it's even deeper than that. Maybe I would be good at it if I would force myself to, but I, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it's, yeah. I no, I, I have some to sort of more, you know, uh, noble sounding or, <laughs> Or uh, you know explanation, but it you makes need me a, happy. You need a um, good glass. But I think of... it's I think it's important, like you said, you know, because how to understand um, 
how to understand what's going on, you know, one, one has to know about um, such things. Um, but yeah, I guess I think I'm just not the right person for it. <laughs> well, you need a, you need a strong glass of scotch or a big fat joint before you, uh, start, before you start listening to those podcasts, that's what you got to do first. And I want to get in, yeah. I want to get into a little bit of what you're right about right wing movements in chapter four, but I just want to wrap up a couple of points from chapter one. And that is one, I wanted you to talk about this critique from inside the movements, particularly from black feminists about this charismatic leader, um, the violence of the charismatic leader, as you put it, or maybe as they put it, but also the practices, and, and we alluded to these earlier, like making sure everyone in the room speaks, but that this comes actually from second wave feminism. Um, I just wanted you to maybe touch on those if you could really quickly. Yeah, the second one's, um, you know, the second one's easy. Is I mean, it seems to me the clearest tradition in the U.S. about, you know, the, the uh, second wave feminism of, of trying to democratize the process within movements, you know, the critique of leadership and struggling with that, um, you know, through consciousness raising groups or, or refusing to have spokespeople or, 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 or making sure that when there's spokespeople, they have to, you know, check with the group before talking to the media, blah, blah, you know, all those sort of things. These are things that, that were worked out, I think, in the 70s and 80s, most clearly, it seems to me, by, um, by feminist collectives. You know, it's also done in other um, and other movements, but um, at least that's a that's a important example. When um, you know, I've been yeah inspired by different critiques of charismatic leadership um, by black feminist authors recently. The one the one one of one of the people we we quote in the book, Erica Edwards, who is a professor and, and, and wrote a book about charisma, you know, charisma and critiquing charismatic leadership. And, you know, it was useful at clarifying for me, you know, because she, I, I remember she poses three ways in which of, you know, she calls them, like you said, violence, but I'm not sure that's the best way of posing it of, of charismatic leadership. You know, one is just that it's historically inaccurate. You know, she's talking there about both black power and the civil rights movements and that the narrative that, you know, the narrative of Malcolm X and, and, and Martin Luther King, or even of the Southern, Southern Leadership Council, et cetera, leaves out all of this actual organizing that was done, you know, that was often gendered female, et cetera. You know, so there's one historical uh, falsity of the story of charismatic leadership. Um, a second is that it, that it generates an anti-democratic politics that, that you know, that she or and, and I too, and you know, many of us are opposed to. And the third is that she sees charismatic leadership as a gendered form. Um, and so leaves out, um, you know, that, 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 you know, she, she doesn't say that a woman couldn't occupy that form. And then we have historical examples of it, but that there is something, um, uh, gendered about it. And so, I mean, what's bringing it then, you know, another thing that, that I've recognized, and I think everyone who's been at, with protests in the last few weeks has recognized, you know, part of the educated nature that you and I've been just talking about is the demand for intersectionality among the, um, that's been so strong within the current protests. Um, you know, so whether it's, you know, I don't know, black trans lives matter in the Brooklyn or, but just in any, in any of the demonstrations, the recognitions, um, certainly about gender and sexuality, um, and other axes of power have really been remarkable. Um, and so I think that, 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 that tradition that, that, that was questioning, uh, the, the male charismatic leader, I think that that is the kind of thing that's been, integrated, you know, that's already a, um, uh, uh, an accomplished consciousness, um, within, within these movements. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. It, some of my friends over the last three weeks have said that they were terrified that there was no leaders, uh, for the BLM movement or the movement for black lives. I sort of made the opposite argument. That's the last point I want to make about, um, what's contained in this, in this, 
particular chapter, but that my response was, thank God there wasn't a leader that was able to get up three weeks ago and tell everybody to go home or to chill out. I mean, my, you know, my response was like, thank God. Like, cause if there, if you would have had one or two people who would have directed what happened or tried to tame the response to George Floyd's murder, I don't think we would be where we're at today, three weeks later, talking about defunding in a real way in many municipalities, defunding uh, police departments and redistributing right. those, that money. Is that, is that sort of how you read it as well? Like let the, let the uprisings go. I mean, I, what I also find interesting from the opposite angle is the level of sophistication for people to kind of scale back. Like once the polling came out that showed that the majority of Americans actually sympathized with these uprisings, even with the burning of the police stations, even with the burning of, you know, condominiums or whatever else was, was burnt or broken or whatever, that the, the overwhelming majority of Americans actually sympathized with this to varying degrees. Um, but that the movement was sophisticated enough to kind of scale back and then redirect its energies to different kinds of actions at a time when they had majority support. Right. I think that's true. I, I think that's true. And, and um, it's unclear. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified as you're sort of suggesting none of us are is uh, to say what is going to be the you know best uh, strategy at this moment, you know, I think the movements, I, 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 I'm, I trust their, I trust their, I trust their reasoning. And like, and like you're saying that there's, there seems to be some really, um, really intelligent decisions that have been made, not by some hidden cabal that has put out the word, but it's much more like, I don't know, a swarm of bees that made the decision to take a left turn and go make the swarm over there, you know. Yep. Um, it's by a logic, a kind of communication on logic that, that, that functions on a different level. Yep. yep. Can you talk about, well, actually, let me stop real quick here. Um, we're at 4.15, Mike, and I don't, yeah. don't want to screw your time up, and I'm just... Well, let's go... I'm, let's go another, let's go until 4.30. Okay. Because then maybe we could, um, you know, do a certain ending of this first chapter or something like that, you know, bring it to a close or. Okay. Or at least just go, let's just go till 4.30 and see where we get, because we don't have to be anywhere in particular. Okay. Because I, I had this mapped out to where I was going to go through different points in each chapter, and I'm only getting to chapter two right now, which is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> there's just too much shit in the book. Well, I shouldn't call it shit. There's too much stuff, yeah. there's too much stuff in the book yeah, for me to... We've talked a little bit about things in chapters three and four, so... Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know... Okay. I did. I just yeah. wanted to get more into like, so in chapter two, for instance, you know, you're talking about leader, uh, leaders and followers, that, like flipping this on its head that we want tactical leadership and strategic movements. Yeah. Let's, let's just get, let's get into that major, because that's a major concept um, Great. that's proposed yeah. in the book. So let's kind of get to the traditional concepts of, of leadership and then where tactics and, and strategy usually comes from. And then where it should go, or where where yeah. it's already going now. So traditionally, we think you know at least Tony and I have thought of a useful and 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 we're taking this from from an earlier Italian um, theorist to think of the relationship between leadership and the multitude or movements in terms of strategy and tactics. And, and traditionally, and this is why I'm doing this, is traditionally because leadership is defined or the role or the purpose of leadership is defined by the ones who operate strategy. You know, strategy meaning those who can see the entire general situation and think in the long term and, and make decisions over the most important matters. Let me put it that way. That's what strategy and that's what leadership traditionally is supposed to be able to do. Whereas tactics, are what can be done at the grassroots. You know, you can make limited and local decisions about specific things, but that always have to fit within, you know, that general strategy. Yeah, I should point out, of course, you know, this is military terminology that that uh, that political struggle has 
has adopted, you know, but for, for several hundred years. Anyway, what, what, what has seemed inspiring to us um, was the way that, in, like I said, we took this from Mario Tronti, who's an Italian writing in the early 60s, you know. Um, and his, his proposal was that um, what we needed to do is flip those responsibilities. You know, so we, it's not that we should uh, eliminate leadership altogether. We need to limit leadership to merely tactical questions. And instead, this is in fact the harder part, um, we need to have people in general, you know, Tony and I use the term multitude, but you could say the movements in general have to become capable of, of strategy, of strategic decisions. And like I said, that first part is at least conceptually easier. You know, we need leadership sometimes to make quick decisions on limited things. Like here's a first, you know, like most banal example, anytime we have a demonstration or a well-organized demonstration, you need some people who are going to pay attention where the police are, if they're starting to arrest people, where should we go next? Like the movement should turn right here because the cops have this set up. And that's a kind of leadership. You know, it's making a tactical decision about something limited. And you, you I'm, I'm totally good with that. Like, I think that's even important. And you can't get the entire demonstration to, you know, anyway, it seems to be necessary. And I can imagine that about any number of other realms of, political decision-making, you know, sometimes in, uh, especially, you know, when, when things are pressing for time, you, you need certain people being in the position to be able to work out local things. But, but, and this is, the, this is then the hard part. It's really the same question of democracy, but anyway, that, 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 um, that the movement as a whole should be capable of, understanding and taking decisions over the most important matters. Um, and that's, so that would mean then, you know, that the multitude is capable of strategy. It's, so it's, yeah, it's, it's flipping the kind of thing. So like, I don't know, here's another example. It might, I don't know if this, it's a different kind of example than that movement police example I just tried, which is, um, there was a, there was a referendum in Berlin in Germany a few years ago about, the power system. And the, the proposal was that, that they wanted to make the power system, you know, like the electrical system, um, open to, uh, you know, they were, they were saying that we wanted to make the power system common, meaning like that it was open to democratic decision-making. And so you might say, you know, like, well, we're not all electrical engineers. How is everybody going to know something? But the question really about strategy there is, making decisions about the most important things. Like, for instance, should there be nuclear energy or not in the power grid? Uh, how much should, should people be charged? You know, should poor people get energy, um, you know, at a different rate? Or should people be cut off if they can't pay their bills? You know, those sort of decisions. You know, it's not like the politicians who are making these decisions today are geniuses. You know, so you get <laughs> what, you, what you do is able to, uh, that, that people as a whole should be able to make the decisions that are, important about a matter like that. You know, this is what I mean by strategy. Whereas then, of course, you have engineers who work things out. You know, you have, I don't know, um, you have uh, a problem in the summer with everyone has the air conditioning on, someone needs to decide about doing X or Y. Um, but that's the kind of thing uh, I mean, or we mean about tactical leadership. I guess it seemed useful for us, you know, partly because there is the tendency to have a rhetoric of the elimination of leadership or there are no leaders or something like that. And so at least for us, it doesn't, that doesn't seem a useful way of putting it. Uh, what seems more useful to us is the kind of, what you call it, maybe downgrade leadership, you know, like to limit the responsibilities and, and to make sure that the important part um, is done collectively. And, and I mean, the, the other thing, like I was saying before, and like, this is the question about democracy too, which is in order to validate such a claim, you have to be convinced that people as a whole 
or the movements or something like that are capable of strategic decision making you know are capable of making of of deciding about the most important things you know rather than that we need um a government of experts who are the only qualified ones to um to make these decisions so i mean in some ways the the large central portion of the book for us was trying to articulate why or justify why or convince ourselves why um people are capable of making you know uh, the most important decisions over over social matters today and and try to validate why they why they should you know it, like i keep saying you know this another way of saying the same thing is trying to convince ourselves that democracy is possible because i think that's the question about democracy too that people can be competent and decide collectively over the most important social questions. Um, so anyway, for us, at least that schema of inverting strategy and tactics was one way just of, of formulating something we think is going on in the movements or, or rather an, um, a, a demand being posed in the movements, maybe not yet realized, but, but still part of the current process. It would also seem to me, this is maybe putting it really simplistically, and tell me if this isn't helpful at all, but it would seem to me that one of the benefits of having the most people involved, like in other words, how would I put this? Having a limited number of people involved in making strategic decisions doesn't seem to make much sense because those few people only have a limited amount of knowledge, perspectives, experiences. In other words, when we're thinking about big issues about strategy, it would be nice to hear from and have as many people participate because it would seem to me that, and it has, I think most of the time been the case that then those strategies encompass a lot more than just two or three people could have thought of to begin with. And that it makes a lot more sense to have a few people involved at the tactical level uh, because there's sort of limited inputs in that kind of a context. Like, should we go left? Should we go right? It also isn't dictating mm -hmm. the future of the organization, which I think is important, or say the values of the organization or its political aims that we've tried in our collective to do this through, you know, maximum participation for strategic decisions and for vision uh, goals, things like this, but that, yeah, at a rally or maybe even setting up the specifics of an event um, making specific decisions within the context of like limited uh, moments within a campaign that that it, yeah, that in fact, it makes a lot more sense to have, you know, one or two people or however many people, but that you don't necessarily need or that it's not ideal even to have maximum participation in that context. Right. No, I think that's exactly right. And that's, that, that that's exactly what we're trying to capture, you know, that kind of, um, that kind of distribution of responsibilities, you know, that you're talking about. If right. it could be as simple as that, you know, that, that makes it sound very practical and it is, um, who's going to be responsible for what, um, and helping decide that, you know, another, uh, and the proportion that it impacts you, I don't mean I was, to interrupt you, Mike, but the proportion, I think the big thing about strategy is the, and the vision or the, the direction of an organization is like your participation should be, in line with the amount that it, like that this is going to impact you. So like that those strategic decisions or vision decisions about an organization is going to have a direct impact on you um, and the future of the organization, which is maybe different than a tactical uh, decision. That's something that is going to impact you or the collective that you're involved with. Yeah. That you should have a to say in that. Totally. Yeah. There's definitely that. And, and also like you were saying earlier that, uh, this sounds corny when I say it like this, but you know, what I was going to say, like, you know, we're all more intelligent than any one of us is, which, which is true too, but, but it's, 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 it, there are other ways of thinking of that more, um, more directly. I mean, you know, some ways this is all, this is all at least one, um, yeah, no, I, I think it's just that way. The collective intelligence thing. The other thing you were saying, I was it reminded me of one of the experiments. This was in 2011 in Occupy. I was at in Slovenia, 
in Ljubljana, strangely. Um, I, I was there and I was at part of it. The, and they, they developed, um, it's not exactly the same thing, but I found it interesting as an experiment, maybe not a, an ultimately good one. There, what they said is that anyone who spoke at the meeting had to be willing to be engaged in whatever they were proposing. You know, so you had to, um, and so you couldn't just put out ideas and then, and then, and then leave. And so it was a kind of like each, each, um, they were trying to propose that like the right to speak was, was, had to be tied to the willingness to act. Yep. That was, uh, yep. um, which was an interesting experiment and I can see how it, it was trying to, obviously trying to correct for certain, um, you know, problems they were having in their, in their local situation. But, um, I don't know why I went down to that, that, that road, but it does seem like this is all in the, um, the, the way of trying to think about how, and the advantages of having everyone participate in the most important decisions rather than keeping them for, um, some supposedly expert, um, few. I mean, here I'm thinking of, uh, ownership, accountability, and empowerment. I mean, the things we think about in these kind of situations, because we practice the same thing. It's like, hey, if you're going to suggest that we do this next Saturday, well, guess who's now in charge of uh, putting that together? <laughs> um, you're not allowed to yeah. just... Uh, but I think part of that is not just like a practical, hey, if you said that, you have to do it. It's like it empowers people. It forces folks to be accountable to the movement, to the collective, which is important. Um, and it allows them to have some ownership of it. It's like if you have some ownership of what you're doing, you're going to be much more excited in our experience than if Michael and Vince come down and, you know, with the grand plan and then you're just a cog in the machine and filling a limited role. I mean, it just seems so obvious to me um, yeah. that that makes sense. Okay, I know we're running up to time, but I want to go through some concepts in Chapter 3 and we'll leave it here for today. So undermining the, and I'm just going to run through like some basic things that I wrote down. I won't get into the details and you can just take it wherever you want and we'll leave it there today. Um, undermining the position of the sovereignty. Um, this exclusive right to exercise political authority is being directly challenged. Uh, you and Negri are directly challenging this. Um, movements are, are trying to challenge that in many different ways. Um, that new forms, but this kind of gets into sections three, two, and three, that new forms of capitalism, cognitive and new, that capital today needs new subjectivities, um, that the very thing, that this is in fact the very thing that could undermine capital. Let me focus more on this undermining the position of sovereignty, and then this critique, and then also like this reevaluating of constituent power. So this idea of undermining uh, sovereignty, the, the idea or the ideas around or the critiques around constituent power and then institutions and sovereignty that we're trying to sort of, that abandoning sovereignty does not mean uh, relinquishing autonomy or self-determination. Yeah, they all three go together in a way. I mean, in some ways, <clears throat> this is me and Tony working with a um, tradition of political thinking that's 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 engaging with the same problems you and I've just been talking about. I mean, so the sovereign here here's a um, you know in in the European philosophical tradition, the sovereign is decide is defined as the one who has the power to decide. Um, you know, so if you think about I don't know the king is sovereign because the king is able to decide, or the council is, or the executive is, or you know whatever. This is what sovereignty means is a centralized and exclusive decision-making capacity. Um, and so in that, if, if insofar as sovereignty means that, we want a non-sovereign politics. But that doesn't sometimes or often sovereignty, now I'm thinking both in philosophical, but just in a, now in our standard usage, sovereignty gets confused with notions about like you said, of autonomy or independence. And, um, and we're trying to, in some ways, isolate them, that, that, that we can have autonomy, meaning uh, self-control, uh, you know, collective self-control, without there being a single decision-making structure. You know, the early modern 
you know, both this is true of European thinking, but also early modern Chinese thinking, you know, other traditions too. They had this, um, they functioned, the, the discourse functioned by an analogy between the political body and the human body. And the idea was that the king was the head and the army was the arms and the peasants were the feet and, you know, whatever. They had this whole thing. And the idea was, to, well, you have to have one head, you know, because you have one brain and you have a centralized decision-making thing. And so sometimes Tony and I would just say, well, you know, like, fuck that. The social body is not like the human body. But it's actually probably more interesting to think that the way neuroscientists think about the brain it's not just that there's like one part of the brain that decides. No, there's this incredible swarm of neurons and synapses and that actually the human brain making a decision is this enormous collective endeavor. So anyway, you might think about, so this is what we're, this is what we're thinking about. It's like a non-sovereign way of thinking of decision-making. And so you would have to then have, think about institutions differently if it's not, that an institution is organized through some centralized and trickle down decision making structures, you know, when one should think about it. And this is really what you and I've been talking about for the last long time here, you know, is about how to construct institutions, you know, institutions in a movement, uh, sometimes just in a, in a social or cultural center, but even institutions like the ways of dealing with each other, you know, this is the way anthropologists talk about institutions, you know, like repeated practices and stuff like that. We want, Tony and I say, well, one of our tasks is to develop non-sovereign institutions. You could say develop um, democratic institutions. You know, it's another way of, as long as one thinks about democracy the way, the way I'm trying to get at here. I don't know, does that make sense about the sovereign? It's a little difficult discourse about the sovereign. It's a little bit, how should I say, because Tony and I are constantly going back and forth between a, a certain history of political thought and contemporary political questions, you know, because we think they have a lot to say each other, to each other, but it doesn't always mean that, um, I don't know, that everyone's interested in what, I don't know, Thomas Hobbes said in 1640 or something like that. No, I think it's really interesting. I mean, this kind of gets back to what I was saying earlier about people coming into the movement, asking questions far deeper than what I think people assume. Sometimes we've had a lot of people, including people from the movement who are new, who are like starting to ask the questions, where do these ideas come from? So not so much just like, how are they playing out today? But like, where do they actually come from? I mean, so part of what you write about, uh, in terms of like undermining this position of sovereignty was that I know you mentioned from Rome through the early modern Europe and then that this is kind of used as a justification for colonialism as well um, and that it, right. it comes back home in the form of centralization and repression and that the liberal response to this has been and again this is stuff that a lot of people just kind of get they're like okay um, the liberal response to this has been laws to temper sovereignty and that the communist response has been to just replace sovereignty with the dictatorship of the proletariat. People aren't really buying into either of those. And I think it helps. And I think there's actually a lot more people who are interested in it, people without, you know, master's degrees, PhDs, whatever, who actually would like to know where these ideas come from and how they've developed over time. I don't think, and I know you're not doing this, but I'm just saying this generally for people who are going to listen to this. And that is, I really think it's important for people not to downplay just how intellectually curious a lot of people in the movement are right now. Yeah. And I think that's something yeah, you know, I've that's learned. Totally in, right. That's something I've learned particularly in the post Trump era uh, where a lot of people were just like, Hey, we, <laughs> you know, we got to get this guy out. We got to do this. We got to do that. And after a year of people kind of flailing around, just doing really non-effective actions, people kind of had to go back to the drawing board and be like, okay, wait a minute. What is leadership? What is power? What is organization? What exactly are we trying to achieve? Those are, I've had more conversations like that in the Trump era than I had in the uh, 12 years prior doing activism. Uh huh. So, I, I, that's I, interesting. You yeah. know, I, I don't know if that means anything, but I think it, in other words, I, the only thing I'll say to you is I would not apologize for using that history uh, and, and like examining that history and then bringing it up to contemporary political. Uh, problems that we face because I think it's really important. It actually helps a lot of us to try and find like 
the roots of these problems as opposed to just dealing with like the, you know, symptoms of, uh, of the major, whatever the disease or whatever you want to call it. Not that it's a disease that might be the wrong way to put, I think you get what I'm saying though. Yeah, totally get what you're saying. And sometimes it seems pathological. Yeah. All right. The, I, I won't get into this idea of constituent power because we're already over 430. So, um, yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you for doing, I hope this wasn't, um, no, no, it's fun. It's fun. So let's think of another, let's, let's do like, do you think we could just do one, one, one more? Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.